we call it grass to grass. We're a circular business um, rather than just grass to glass. Um, and so we we do we do control uh, everything from the from the, the gra- blades of grass on the ground to the cow, through the, the way we process, um, and through f- distribution to the consumer. So that, that there's that connection with our our customers and our consumers. This is the producers. I'm Danny Vallant. Simon Schultz runs Schultz Organic Dairy, a family operation with 50 years of history across three generations. Based in Pretty Tim Boone behind the Great Ocean Road west of Melbourne, Simon produces organic milk from a single herd of Frisian and Jersey cows. The Schultz range also includes yogurt, cream and quark, with a focus on producing and supplying sustainably. Milk in glass bottles isn't just cosy nostalgia, it's present day reality. Um, so my name's Simon Schultz, I'm a third generation dairy farmer from South West Wick Timboon and uh, my business is Schultz Organic Dairy and we not only farm dairy cows but we also process that beautiful milk into cream, yogurt, milk and cheese and butter and distribute that to cafes and retailers throughout Melbourne and Victoria. So the uh, the short story starts with my my grandfather Herman who um, immigrated from Germany after the World War. I think he was about um, 10 or 12 during the Second World War. Uh, Migrated out to uh, Victoria um, in the very early 50s, uh, eventually settled in Timboon in 1972 after working his way uh, around the district for a number of years. Um, found this beautiful parcel of land in, in Timboon, Victoria, where he felt that the climate was conducive to dairy cattle. Um, and um, so he and my grandmother, uh, Marla, started up uh, organic farming in that very beginning. Um, and actually they were, they were forced, they um, begged, borrowed and stole from everyone they could to purchase the land. And um, within the very first 12 months, the dairy industry collapsed um, back in 1972 and they were forced to farm without the convention of the day, which was um, chemical farming, um, high amounts of nitrogen and and so forth. So they were forced to go to biodynamic because of a collapse in the milk price at the time. Um, And they were, you know, um, dead up to the to the hilt, so to speak, and so yeah, they they pioneered that back back then before organics was really a thing, um, and biodynamics was really just coming to the fore in Europe, and they they farmed bi- biodynamically. Um, if we fast forward to 1984, um, my grandfather and my grandmother were still um, farming organically or biodynamically then, and they were just weren't getting the value for their their milk at the time and so they they decided that the best way to see value in what they were doing and the the high quality milk they were producing was to value add and so they started making um, some French style cheeses on the back doorstep or the back veranda of the house. Uh, They had a sunken concrete uh, tank in which they matured some cheeses um, uh, buried under earth and yeah, really started if one of the first reintroduction of farmhouse cheese production here in Australia, and um, that was back in 1984. They built a new factory um, 12 months within 12 months, and um, their business, which was uh, Tim Moon Farmhouse Cheese, was born and and grew and and was flying out in Qantas at its peak, um, sold into Coles and Woolworths at its peak as well, um, and. Come fast forward again, they um, about 20 years to uh, 2000. The the family um, decided that <clears throat> while they were farming uh, farming as well, and and then the value adding the that the the pressures of business was too much for them, and they decided to sell the original um, manufacturing part of the business, the the cheese making, um, and they sold it to King Island Dairy back in uh, back in 2000. Um, at that time, uh, my, I myself was uh, quite young. I was still still at school, and um, so I was never given the opportunity and the option to um, continue on that family legacy of um, of cheese making and value adding. Even though I had worked and did work um, in the, my early adult years in the sold now sold uh, cheese business, um, it wasn't until two thousand six where. I had ventured back to Melbourne and had ventured into um, some small business development um, and had been working in a few other cheese factories and dairy factories here in Melbourne. Um, 
to get some experience, um, it was I was invited back to the family farm, and you know, my grandfather uh, invited me back as long, along with my father, who at the time uh, had been running the dairy farm for um, for quite some years, probably since since near eighty four, he'd been running the the farm on behalf of my my father and and himself. Um, I was invited back, and uh, with a small amount of investment from both those in in me, I guess um, Schultz Organic Dairy was born, and uh, and that. Uh, was the idea was born in 2005, and and we converted an old cheese factory, an old actually an old dairy, um, a tiny little old dairy into a cheese factory because um, at the time King Island was still producing cheese out of out of the original factory, and um, Schultz Organic Dairy was born. So um, they invested in me. They gave me the funds to uh, to start up something fresh and something new, and um, in those early years we focused on yogurt predominantly um, and and milk, which was not conflicting with the original the original family history in cheese making so that's um the very beginning of the story i guess in terms of uh, our journey to to uh now and then obviously the last 15 16 years have been incredibly um challenging but also um enlightening in terms of what we've achieved over the last 15 years now as well The rhythms of life in a dairy farming family are dictated by the milking needs of the cows. What was it like for Simon to grow up on the family farm? My father was was a dairy farmer um, for the family uh, and our exposure to really the cheese making side of the business was relatively um, light on and so my my parents would um, talk about dairy farming predominantly. The the conversation was always about the challenges of dairy farming and the um, ins and outs um you know i vastly recall rarely going on holidays with the family because dairy farming is a you know a a seven day a week um 365 days a year job where uh you're milking at four or five o'clock in the morning and you're not finishing until six o'clock at night and then you know and then there's other challenges like checking cows late at night especially if they're um in the late stages of their pregnancy so um my exposure as a kid was really um seeing my father and my mother go through those oh, those challenges of being a dairy farmer um, and then the being able to grow up on you know on a thousand acres of beautiful country land with with bush to play in kangaroos uh, motorbikes um, mud you know all the things that young kids love um, and my children love as well in in, in exploring uh, the great outdoors that we were so blessed to actually have been to have grown up in. So, um, yeah, my childhood was really all about playing outside, not so much uh, taking too much uh, knowledge and understanding of what my parents and the struggles they were going through. Certainly, as young young kids, probably eleven, twelve, we would we would get the dairy cows in. Um, you know, in the early days, we'd probably have to walk, um, and then we're on the little three-wheeler motorcycle pottering around, um, and uh, you know, getting getting uh, cow rides by my father and my mum on the Jersey cows, uh, the, the, all the the stragglers, the ones the what we call the um, the friendly cows that always seem to linger at the very back of the the line, um, getting cow rides. That I remember uh, certainly some great memories of that when I was younger. Um, and then probably the mid-teens, I was you know, then starting to milk cows with um, with the farm hands at the time, uh, starting to learn that that trade, and that was that was great as a young kid, um, working with um, working with some some um, non-family members, I suppose, to to sort of open us up to um, that that social etiquette of of, of uh, working with older with well, older people. They they probably weren't all that much older than myself, they, you know, my four or five years, but. Um, yeah, that certainly developed my my personality working with them, and then just the fun in the summer where you'd, you'd squirt each other with hoses, and and the conversations you'd have uh, walking up and down the pit lane um, while milking cows. It was yeah, it was a lot of fun. With his family's identity bound up in dairy, Simon had an urge to leave the farm and do his own thing, but somehow he kept gravitating to dairy-related jobs. And slowly but surely, the industry reeled him back in. In those early years, when I first um, when I first left school, I, I did work in the factory um, for twelve months. But I guess um, I was at that stage in life where I just really needed to find out who I was. So I left the farm, uh, moved to Melbourne, um, found a, a nothing sort of job in those those first that first twelve months, and that that it was really just about fleeing the coop. You know, getting out and exploring, trying to find out who I am and and what I was, and um, 
yeah, certainly made some mistakes in those early years. And, and I don't think I even spoke to my father and my, my parents really for six months, probably just a text message uh, saying, yeah, I'm all okay. But, you know, it was it was probably a while since until I saw them. And I didn't really have any major interest to come back to the farm. Um, I just found myself in those, those three years in Melbourne just falling into jobs that happened to be in the dairy industry um, because that's what I kind of knew. Um, I guess the catalyst for me having interest in the deer industry was really I I was involved in a business in Dandenong, uh, another cheese business that did um, uh, predominantly yogurts, but they did some cheeses as well. Um, I was given some charge over a production line uh, making some um, cottage cheese, um, but I was also given some um, influence in some R&D work and so my grandfather had ha- happened to have some ownership in this business and and so uh, I was blessed enough to have um, uh, a bit of freedom there and so he and I uh, were working on some really innovative uh, low fat or skim milk based camemberts and they were really flavoursome, they were based off quark um, but really flavoursome, be- grew beautiful beautiful white mould, um, lasted forever and made out of, out of low fat milk and that was really the turning point for me, you know, developing something, being creative, um, and then, um, and then, unfortunately, the the company that we were working for wasn't really interested in some of the developments we did. Uh, they were in some, but in, in most of them they weren't. And my grandfather said, "Well, Simon, we've got this, you know, we've got this old factory. Why why don't we? Um, why don't you come back and start up the family business?" And at that point in time, I was a bit disheartened about doing all this work into. R and D for this company, and um, yeah, not seeing any any value in that. So not feel it, probably not feeling valued as well. And so yeah, I, the invitation was there. The um, you know the negotiations about you know my grandfather investing in in me, I suppose, and giving me a bit of money to to rebuild a factory, a bit like he did, I suppose. I you know we were a hundred percent indebted to him and my father, and um, yeah, that's where that's where I came back and. And I probably still was sort of stumbling around those first couple of years, just doing the work, developing, and not really having the passion. But it was it was after a couple of years of doing farmers markets and and starting to see some success and some developing some relationships with, um, you know, with um, with people like Will Stud in in the cheese cheese world and um, his his daughter Fleur Stud and and other chefs as well, um, Shannon Bennett and and Dan Hunter, for example. So developing those relationships really got me inspired and, and f- found that passion after a couple of years. So it was probably 2008, 2007, 2008 until I, you know, I really knew that that um, being in the dairy industry and staying on the family farm was truly, really what I, I believed in, what I what I loved, and and um, yeah, and then since then, looking beyond the family and looking beyond just Schultz and seeing, well, you know, what. It led me down the path of, um, you know, really what is my impact and what's my company's impact on the environment in which I in uh, which I live in, and the environment, the packaging, the waste, but also the uh, the community that uh, my business and I th- uh, worked in and thrived in, um, and so that's where in the last certainly last five years, six years, we've really uh, developed as a business to really focus on more than just what. Schultz provides in terms of dairy. It's it's really about how we engage with our community, um, local community, the Melbourne community, the food community. Uh, how we engage with our environment, both on the farm. We've been you know we've been certified organic for fifty years. Um, but what are we? What else? Or what else can we do to contribute or, or to um, improve our environment? And that's where our milking glass, our packaging. Um, Developments on milking glass and and this the circular economy base of the glass and and now our kegs that's really where my passions have li- have, have lied um, in trying to improve our effect on the environment and on our community. Milk is a basic grocery staple, often considered little more than white stuff in a bottle to pour over cornflakes. Simon explains how he was coaxed into selling milk as a gourmet product. Uh, the very first year was uh, our yogurt and quark. We did a, a German-style fresh cheese. Um, we didn't tackle. We weren't. We weren't um, wanting to step on the toes of my grandfather's original business, which was um, a lot of French-style cheeses. 
Um, and so we, we really focused on um, other value adds like the yogurts and, and the quark and cream. And then after, after about six months, eight months, um, I had a few customers say, you, you know, your products are brilliant, but we'd love you to do boutique milk. And I saw a space in the, at that point in time that no one was doing um, boutique milk. It was only the major players. It was only you know, the, the multinationals really um, producing this product. Um, and I thought, well, you know, consumers are asking me for this product. I'm, I'm gonna basically do what they ask. And, and uh, so with, that's where the milk was born. Um, and then, you know, an encouragement through Will Studd and, and his, his daughter Fleur um, taking on our brand in the very early days when they, they opened up um, really sort of um, allowed us to, um, to get some traction with the, with the cafe market as well as um, consumers. So it was, um, yeah, it, was, it wasn't initially what we first went into, but we were very adaptive to what we felt the consumers wanted. When milk is allowed to express itself, it naturally tells the story of seasons changing. What differences can consumers expect when milk is produced naturally? Our milk particularly is, is very seasonal. Um, we, we don't standardise any of our milk, and so as the cow gives it is what, what our consumers uh, get in the bottle. Um, so we don't take fat off the top, we, um, we don't take out flavours like the bigger multinationals. We um, don't put in flavours um, or proteins like the bigger multinationals. Um, we don't do permeates. So, so the consumer really does get to see and taste the seasons of the year. What we're seeing right now in spring is as the, the sun starts to, to come out more, we'll start seeing higher sugars in the milk. Um, therefore, there should be slightly sweeter flavours um, this time of year. Um, as we go into summer, depending on what the cows are eating, um, you know, the, we farmers do a lot of what they call summer crops. So that could be things like uh, turnips, rapes, brassicas, um, sorghums, that sort of thing. That can bring in other flavours through too as well. Um, then as we move into uh, autumn, uh, and sort of late summer, early autumn, where the grass, the grass that they're eating is no longer fresh. It's often um, not not dead, but browning. Uh, so it's, it's, it's not as green as it usually is in spring. It, uh, I suppose the, the, the way I describe the milk, it comes across a little bit more barney. It's, it, it's a little bit more fibrous, you would say. Um, in terms of coffee, you know, this time of year is usually the best time for frothing. Frothing um, of a milk in a coffee is very um, specific to proteins and a particular type of protein to create the micro foaming that they, you get in your coffee. Um, so foaming this time of year is usually a lot better than, than in other times of the year, uh, even though overall the protein content goes down this time of year. Um, then in winter, um, you know, there's a lot more silage fed, which is fermented grass. So that does change the flavors subtly as well. Um, but more and more, as as we learn what the cows are doing, what they're eating, and and um, and so forth, we try and keep a relatively consistent diet for them, um, despite the the fact that the grass grows this time of year and it doesn't grow in summer. Um, so yeah, the the flavours are more consistent than they were 15 years ago when I first started, um, and you know it, it also and flavours also determined by um, what stage of lactation the cows are in. Um, we're carving year round now, so that's not normally an issue. It's quite consistent for us now. An encounter with sustainability pioneer Yoast Backer was transformative, spurring Simon to offer milk in returnable glass bottles. A development, a relationship that I had um, um, developed, I suppose, uh, um, with Yoast Backer um, from from Silo or, or from the greenhouse, and he he coming to me. Um, probably late 2000s, um, yeah, 2009, maybe 2010, and asked me to put milk into a stainless keg for him. And really delivering to his store, myself, and and, and just discussions with him um, and his team about um, what he was trying to do and the effects of, of plastics and, and all this waste that uh, he was trying to, uh, to save from, from, the envi- from landfill. Um, really inspired me, and, and um, that made me. You know, we we invested in the, the doing milk to kegs, and also actually invested in 
get putting milk into glass back in back in those early very early years. Um, I guess the problem I found was that I was very very busy and I never really fully realised that dream of putting milk into glass until um, the War and Waste, the first season, which um, Yoast was also a part of, um, and that and that really really um, convicted me of well, Simon, you've got these glass bottles here. You've you've been dreaming of this of this uh, innovation going back to glass for for many years with Yoast and, and with others. You know now it's time to actually you know put do something about it. And so that uh, within a few months after that uh, three months, I think we launched our milk and glass through the farmers markets um, and. <laughs> Um, to great success, you know, the consumers really, really enjoyed the fact that we were not, it's not a, not a linear system. We were, we were returning the glass bottles, washing them and, and then refilling them and, and then putting them back out there. So these, these glass bottles that were designed for, for throwaway or for recycling were being reused time and time again. Um, and um, so we, we took that, that the success, that small little success at the farmers markets to go, well, well now we want to develop a bottle that's going to last the test of time. Um, and so we crowdfunded for that and, and had huge success at that point in time. We raised um, uh, over $100,000 to, to invest in di- new washing machinery and, um, and glass bottle de- design development and so forth that would, um, would lead us through, through the next few years. Um, so, yes, yeah, so we crowdfunded for, for these glass bottles um, and the development of, uh, I took a trip to the US where um, glass bottle manufacturing and, um, and dairy companies were filling and, and, and having this circular economy with their glass bottles in the USA, um, got some lessons and learned some things there and brought it back and applied it to us. And so um, I think we're, we're th- three or four years in now to our glass bottles. We've saved over 25 tonne of glass, of 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 potential landfill or waste going to landfill or, or waste plastic. Um, and yeah, seen huge, huge success in that. And we're looking forward to the next development for us to, to be able to release that more um, um, to more customers and more consumers so that, because it's, it has been incredibly successful today. Glass bottles are great, but what about going even further? Simon explains the Udder Way milk on tap system for food service and retail too. The Udder Way keg was um, really the, the the beginning of of a more commercialised version of what I had ri- originally started with Yoast back um, back ten years ago. Um, again, he he inspired me to. He asked the question, Simon, I want you to put milk in gl- into kegs, and I and I did that for him. It was not necessarily commercially vi- viable for us back then, but um, we had been working on um these these kegs for a number of years we have we have a, f- a variety of different versions uh, a couple of yeah you know, we must the other way must be version three or four um marginal success at each development but always improvement and so um with coronavirus we had uh, just before the the pandemic hit um we had planned to do some major r d and really push the um the kegs into food service particularly and um but also retail um, the pandemic hit, and as as everyone did, they everyone contracted then, and and we didn't want to risk developing something that we weren't quite sure was going to work in the market, especially when um, food service and cafes were really under the pressure, um, and 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 many closing down. So we shelved it for a while, um, and then earlier this year, uh, one of my customers, Leaf uh, Leon from Leaf, who's been a huge supporter of Schultz for for the sixteen years that we've been been here um he made the connection he said simon i know you've been looking at kegs for a while um here is a cus- here is a company that's just started launching the other way and so he connected us we reached out and i was just about to go on my first holiday for uh, six for six years um or first decent holiday for six years and um basically we had a meeting with ed from the other way and i said ed we're going to do it um you guys organise it with my staff while I'm away, and then we'll launch as soon as I get back. And and essentially that's what it is. I you know I'm very committed to it, um, to the idea of of reducing our you know collectively our impact on on um, landfill and particularly on on plastic use. And the other way was a a great solution that had solved some of the problems that I had with my developments in previous generations. Um, and yeah, and so it's. A, 
Um, it's, a, it's an early partnership with the other way. It's only been going three months at this point in time. Um, but, you know, we're seeing seeing some good successes there and they're seeing an appetite from consumers to reduce their impact on the environment. And, you know, um, we just need, you know, collective, we need small business, all businesses to do small steps to improve. Um, you know, I, I'm of a vision that, you know, we're, Schultz is 50 years um, this year, 50 years of organic farming. Um, Schultz Organic Dairy is, uh, you know, 16 years of since since it started with just, just me starting back in a small factory. But, you know, our vision is going to 100 years, you know, another 50 years from now. Um, and to think and try and plan for things to, of small steps that we can gradually make over the next 50 years to, you know, hopefully be carbon positive and, and, and have no impact on the on landfill and so forth. I mean, that these are big crystal ball dreams and ideals, but if we don't start now and if we don't start taking small steps, um, then uh, we will never achieve it. Schultz products are loved for their flavour, quality and traceability, but that's just the beginning of the reasons people seek them out. In business, you often talk about a lot of unique selling points and, and our list is incredibly long and, and sometimes difficult to remember every single point. Um, I think our consumers really, you know, we're certified organic, so that is clearly a, a, um, a point of difference to to our consumers. Um, the but, but there are more organic dairies coming, which is great to see um, people embracing the uh, organic food uh, movement. Um, we, I think people will enjoy our, our um, transparency and our connectiveness. Um, you know, we are grass to, we call it grass to grass. We're a circular business um, rather than just grass to glass. Um, and so we, we, do, we do control um, uh, everything from the from the, the gra- blades of grass on the ground to the cow, through the, the way we process, um, and through f- distribution to the consumer. So that th- th- there's that connection with our our customers as, and our consumers um, that I think um, is a great attribute to our business. And and it's not common. Well, it's very rare in Australia to have a business that is that vertically integrated and, and goes from the from the cow all the way to the consumer. Um, we actually even own our own little cafe on farm. So we, we really do understand um, cafes and, and retailers um, from, our, from our own point of view. Um, we, we, we deal with uh, all the challenges that they do on a small scale, but many of the challenges that they do as well. So we can really relate to people all along the supri- supply chain. Um, and I think our consumers really uh, embrace that. Um, and, and the biggest the, probably the biggest thing that makes us stand out is our commitment to um, our waste management um, and what we're doing to minimise the waste that we have on the farm, um, which we've done for 50 years. You know, we're, we're certified organic. We, we, we don't use synthetic fertilisers, insecticides, pesticides. We're not pouring on chemicals or nitrogen that's petroleum-based. Um, but now we're also really focused on um, creating that circular economy with our milk and glass and our, and our kegs. Uh, and if the consumers demand it, we will, um, you know, it'd be great to see in 50 years' time that we're not processing any plastic at all it's, and it's all in glass or it's all in all in the kegs. So, you know, it's, at the end of the day, we're guided by what the consumer consumer demands and wants and, and those three things are, um, the, those three things being organic, uh, being vertically, vertically integrated and being committed to being carbon positive and, and, and in, in the impact on our environment and community um, are the three key things that make Schultz different. Australian consumers love dairy, but that doesn't mean the industry is thriving. Simon outlines the huge challenges that have beset the industry and the serious impacts on mental health and the viability of farming and milking. The dairy industry in Australia is really is really struggling. It has for a number of years. Um, probably since 2000, it's really been declining. Um, deregulation came in, which really gave the um, power into the ma- um, into the manufacturers, and particularly the multinationals, the big pro- big producers, Fonterra, uh, Murray Goulburn, when it was existing, and and so forth. Um, and you know, the, the the last number of years since 2016, when the um, when the dairy industry had their milk price collapse, um, you know that that really um, really damaged the dairy industry internally 
um, many dairy farmers, you know, there was so many that committed suicide in that period of time. Mental health has been terrible for dairy farmers for, for a long time. It's, it's really, it, dairy farmers, reti- when they retire, they turn in, they go into beef farming and sheep farming. You know, dairy farmers never, always a farmer, but um, we retire to a less intensive form of farming, I suppose you would say. So it's a very tough gig. And when you're getting, as a farmer, when you're getting hit around a lot by milk price and getting undervalued and devalued, um, you know, it, it takes a terrible toll on, on your finances, your family life. Um, and we can see that in the dairy industry just simply by the number of farmers that are getting really, really old. Um, you know, the average age of agricultural and particularly dairy is, is is quite old. And there's a huge exodus in, in dairy at the moment, um, which is why everyone's seeing such high prices um, for in on the retail shelf as well as... Um, as well as the farm gate, um, but farmers are still leaving despite the high prices because the stress, um, the abuse they've received in the past from from you know uh, from processes, but also seeing their product devalued on the shelf by Coles and Woolworths, and seeing you know seeing milk sold cheaper than cheaper than water, and yet it's so much more intensive. So um, yeah, I think farmers, dairy farmers particularly, feel very undervalued. Um, we've slightly we've sat outside of that. Thank thankfully um you know we're, my philosophy is that my farm doesn't need to keep growing and keep getting bigger just to survive um whereas that's been the agricultural um mo for for many many years that that the only way to survive is get bigger and, and get you know get into more debt and we've bucked that trend by value adding so um yeah i do fear for my you know my fellow farmers we're all, we're all it's all tough and and it's tough for us too I mean, the last three years have been <laughs> tough for everyone and and i think everyone can relate to that um so yeah i I do fear for the industry and it's i think prices are going to get more expensive i think uh, more farmers are going to keep exiting the industry um land prices are very high in agriculture at the moment so old older farmers and younger farmers are younger farmers are struggling to get into the industry and older farmers are um you know selling up and retiring so it's it's going to be tough Simon is passionate about his role as custodian of Schultz Organic Dairy. What does he love about what he does? I love the fact that my job is I can never predict what I'm going to do each day. Um, I have no routine because apart from the first thing, getting coffee in the morning is the, is the quintessential part of my job. <laughs> um, the, I love the fact that my, my day is very varied. Um, I can go through and have numerous conversations with um, with my customers and consumers. I really enjoyed that and thrived that when I was younger and delivering direct to customers um, where I'd have these you know, great chats with people. Um, I, but I also love being out in the country and being isolated and by myself on the farm and, and not being distracted by staff and by customers and, and you know, mowing grass for silage season or um, doing various work in the tractor. It, it's um, when it's when it's sunny outside. It's fantastic being on the farm. When it's pouring rain outside, I'm very happy to be in an office or um, being in Melbourne and talking to customers. You know, it's um, generally I, I really enjoy what I do. It's just because it's the variety I, I get. Simon Schultz is a modern producer with a meaningful family legacy. He's focused on the health of the dairy industry and the impact he can have on the supply chain and his customers, especially by putting carbon positive operations at the heart of his ambitions. Every creamy cafe latte, every dollop of yogurt on a bowl of muesli is a vote of confidence in Simon Schultz's small batch, organic, grass to grass pathway. This is The Producers, a Deep in the Weeds production. I'm Danny Vallant. Stay tuned as we talk to some of Australia's best farmers, makers and growers. Follow us on Instagram at Producers Podcast or contact us via deepintheweeds.com.au.